relaxed in the evening a little and uh, enjoy the music and the wine. Um, anyway, so we're going to start off this morning uh, just with feedback from the various working groups so that we can get to hear a little about what was discussed and what uh, insights arose through that. Um, I think perhaps we should start then with, should we start with group two? Yes, Tom? Okay, over to you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, this was, yeah, the group I was with was with Adrian, with Sara and Teresa, who said they wouldn't be here to do this talk because they'd be making coffee, but they're here. Uh, and Nick, who's not here. Um, so the, um, the first question about what is a sample archive, how would you define it? Um, we actually launched straight into quite a uh, uh, detailed, perhaps, um, discussion about an archive versus a collection. I think, um, yeah, we just started talking about what that meant. And, and I, I think the, the outcome was that we, didn't, we, we understood the, the, the glossary terms about the archive being more about a byproduct of an activity of an individual institution. But we felt they were very, very, um, what do I press? Um, um, but yes, there was, it, it was a quite a, um, a, a, an, in, an imprecise uh, distinction. So we therefore stopped worrying about the archive, word of that sample archive in terms of sample. Um, and I think a lot of this has been, um, came up in some of the working groups online. I, I remember some of it. Um, trying to define what a sample is, which I think everybody thinks they know what a sample is, but actually it's very hard to, to really uh, define it properly. Um, some of the things that came up that we all agreed on were that a sample has to have a purpose or reason that often takes you into why a sample's taken. And we went down, not a rabbit hole, but we went into quite a sort of nice conversation about the, almost the, the ethics of sampling, which I know a lot of people think about. Um, we try to bring it back to when sample collections exist, it's too late to think about whether they should or should not have been taken. But obviously it's, it's part of the same thing when uh, sample collections are being taken and a, a collection is growing. Uh, there was a lot of concerns about bad practice and that's a very, very you know, loose term too, but the, the concern about as profiles of sample collections uh, increase, perhaps it might trigger um, less ethical sampling as well as good sampling. So we, we, we kind of um, got stuck on that a little bit. Um, we also had the um, discussion about how a sample is different from a fragment, uh, indeed from an item, an object. There were some linguistic uh, distinctions between item and object that I didn't fully grasp, um, but there was a lot of discussion about that because some of these uh, collections have things like uh, artist brushes, palettes. Palettes would be a, an object, but with individual or, or mixed up paint samples, so quite complicated things. Um, so all of these things seem to be included in the, in the collections and archives we're talking about. So essentially it's a very loose and broad term that may or may not need to be defined. That was my little thing I did this morning at four o'clock when I woke up. Um, I should say Asian and Sarah and Teresa, please do um, jump in if I get any, any of this wrong or inaccurate. Um, so therefore, back to the question, what is a sample archive? Um, it, we thought as, as good as we got yesterday, based on obviously existing uh, glossary term that is, is, is pretty clear as well. It is a very broad term. And we did use this word assemblage that's used in the glossary to get around that is it an archive or, or is it a collection of of some things, great term, but terms here, these are the samples um, and samples are, are, we think always smaller than the whole um, and have a reason to be collected or assembled. Um, we think our sample archives always, this may not be true, but we think always contain the samples themselves plus related information and data, the metadata or other things. Uh, an archive is often defined by its users. In other words, it's, it's a, being a product of the use, usage of the samples within it. Um, it typically would be the result of an individual institutional activity. That's going back to the, the more precise archive description. And in fact, there are widely different access policies. And I think access policies is one of the things we're really trying to think about with sample archives. 
So the next part of the question about what are the key terms that you'd use to describe a sample archive and to communicate its purpose and, and significance, um, the, these are listed in, in, the, in the order that we uh, pull them out. So they, they may jump around a bit and I didn't spend time trying to pull them together into groups of, of um, thoughts or concepts, but um, the sort of terms that need to be discussed, uh, need to be included, we thought, um, just the basic sample typology, all, all the different sorts of samples you might get. We said from the powder, powder sample to a fragment, uh, could be the part of an object. Um, there has to be some um, key description of the purpose of, of your sample archive. Um, access and access protocols are an essential part of that too. Um, the functionality or uses, so why, why we're keeping this, um, this, this material and why, we, why should we use this um, material. Significance values attribute, that's a you know, big, big term that we'll get into more detail in just a few slides. Um, the, the, the legacy of the, of the sample collection is clearly very important, passing down to generations. Um, the, the question about, in different cases, who owns the sample, the per permissions needed to, uh, to visit or access those uh, collections. Um, there's a lot of didactic information possible, associated data specifically for sort of education uh, uses, edu educational values. Um, and I can't, we wrote down communicating values, and I can't really remember uh, much about that other than if we're trying to communicate its purpose and significance to say communicating just seems we need to communicate. Is there anything I've, can you remember, Adrian, what that was really referring to? Okay, yeah, raising awareness. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, going on slide two, um, archives we thought could be sort of open or closed, depending on whether they're still active, growing, or whether if it's an archive from someone that has passed away, an institution that's wrapped up, it's, it's probably complete and hence closed. Um, there's an enormous responsibility, of course, to if you're looking after a sample archive to preserve it. And a lot of that might be about conditioning, uh, monitoring the condition. Uh, of the samples and indeed of the uh, environment. Um, good old tangible, intangible values. Um, I, I was starting to kind of get hit by jet lag yesterday at this moment. And I remembered this next one. Tangible has relationships, intangible has associations. I wrote that down. I can't even quite work that out this, 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 this morning, but if anyone wants to <laughs> speak to Adrian about that one, would you want to, yeah, do you want to come up? Okay. Should Adrian come you for the Zoom people? Should Adrian come and talk at the? Uh, is that right? Probably better. I don't know how many Zoom visitors we have, but okay. Obviously, we're we're using we're using language here, and language you can interpret in many ways. But I think the the notion was to think about a word like relationships between physical things and the real world, people and things, um, and then. Um, but then associations which are in the mental worlds between things. So really a, 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 um, a, slight, a slight difference. Um, but um, we didn't have time to, to, um, to define those. Thank you. Would you I might stay, stay there. Because <laughs> I, know, I know there's another slide coming up, but I'm going to say, Adrian. Um, so the concept of time, samples are collected at very specific moments in history, and, that, and the sort of the, the time-based part of collections and how they're collected is is, uh, is quite important. And I mean, this the deterioration is actually connected to the responsibility to preserve. But of course, materials in a sample archive are deteriorating. Um, also, it's not like a you you have your sample and they're completely. Um, static and stationary and, and, and stable. Um, so on to the third question for the uh, afternoon session. What qualities, values make heritage samples, archives important? Are there commonalities? So we, we got into a very, very lengthy discussion here um, about the difference between a values and a physical attributes. And in fact, what we ended up with was um, quite a nice, one of those big post-it notes. And you can see the sort of the sort of um, uh, thicker pen starting to distinguish what attributes are and what values are. So attributes, you can probably read the thicker green pen, the physical, tangible, condition, form, sentry uh, technique, that kind of stuff. And then the values, we started um, um, writing some of these down. 
uh, documental, I think that says testimonial, scientific, didactic, education, rarity, uniqueness, artistic, cultural reference, monitoring over time, blah, blah, blah. But then you can see all this other um, writing happened. And, and when we looked at this to kind of <laughs> pull our notes together, it was kind of may, maybe just to keep this archive and start to understand that the, the extraordinary um, depth of conversation that happened. Um, and I will just kind of say one more thing and then, and then we'll come back to this. And I, I was struggling to try and write this down. And then Adrian, Sarah, Teresa went off and was sort of getting very excited and they came up with this, which is in addition to attributes, there's generating relata and values. And at this point, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. So Adrian, talk us through some of that. If you, if you go back to yes. the one before, Tom, um, it seems that there's a, there's a document in the sample itself. It's a, it, it appears to be a physical document of some sort. And then there's the documentation as well. So um, in German, it's quite distinct because you have the front um, uh, and the stand. Um, the front is a, a report that you make about something in the physical world. It's not the thing itself. And so we were quite concerned that the, all these things weren't put under the umbrella of values, but we just tried to sort them out a little bit. Why is that important? Because if otherwise we may think that the values aren't necessarily intrinsic or essential to physical values. Whether we use or decromatize to use the word attribute or something else or, uh, and values, um, we felt it necessary because the documentation in the object itself uh, there's a lot of it. There's a piece of documentation of time, a time stamp um, is, is uh, different to the documentation that we might make. And if we go on to the next one, the point here was trying to make something positive in terms of um, where you might have values from what you generated, the relata, all of the, the data relations that you might have, and the physical sample itself, just trying to pull those things out rather than having. Uh, big uh, suit. Whether that's helpful or not, we don't know, but we, we thought it was important to make some sort of distinction. And these are porous walls to a certain extent, uh, always with, with these, these, these things. Um, a radio, uh, uh, an x-ray, an, an x-ray radiograph or any piece of data that has a physical form is a separate piece of documentation that also needs to be archived. So you've got your sample archive that might be small and your documentation archive, research archive, which could be massive in terms of physicality and also needs conservation attention. So that's why we were setting those things up. And, and of lunch course, break, you'll be filling in the columns. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> and, the, and the, the values we understood as being um, not, not measurable in terms of induction or empirical um, ways that the attributes might be, but um, are things that are cha changeable depending on um, social values, personal values, emotion, etc. I'm going to, I will probably go way over our time slot. So, just two more slides. So, the purpose of a statement of significance and what its key elements are. We actually thought a statement of significance needs to exist. And I it was coming from a collection where we didn't have a statement of significance for the Getty uh, reference collection for quite a while. We obviously have, have created one or drafted one up for this meeting, but uh, it felt actually pretty fundamental. Um, it should be a summary of the archive. It's often its use. Uh, it's often for promoting uh, its existence, lobbying for resources or funding or indeed um, sharing among partners. So it, it, it needs to be known in that way. Um, there's a, a lot of um, ways that the sample collection can be described and how it could be used for interpretation. Um, ownership, provenance, location of archive uses, these are all sort of fairly important things that should be in your statements. Um, and then with another line of study, narrative, history, biography. Um, the identity or uniqueness of the samples themselves or the collection um, is probably, it should be quite high up. And then access again um, is, is, is an area that I think a lot of us are, are thinking about quite specifically, I think. Oh, and the good ways to derive a statement of significance. And I'm, I think everyone did this, certainly in, in the posters, it, it felt very, very across the, 
um, the board, but a broad consultation with interest groups. Um, we call them interest groups, not stakeholders. I forget exactly why we didn't like stakeholders, but it was the interest groups felt um, a, a bit more relevant here. Um, and it's, just, and yeah, just, yeah. just to say that uh, the notion with stakeholder, just the word, assumes that you may think you have a stake in something, which um, you may not, you may be on the periphery, you may be on the outside, but you may have an interest in something. But that's right, yeah, yeah. differentiate that into it. Um, Interviews and surveys are often ways of getting information and the multi inter transdisciplinary discourse. Um, I think everyone understands that in this room. Um, one of the things that came up was this idea of doing role play, which sounds a bit kinky, but I don't think it's meant in that way. Um, but this, but this idea of you have, do have, for example, a conservative curator with quite classic roles. You, you ask them to switch and, and see the other person's point of view. It's just, it's just another tool that, that can be used to get to a very a much more sort of objective. Uh, I think, um, statement of significance. And that's us. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. So, uh, for better or worse, I've condensed all of our things into one slide here, which I'll just talk through quickly. Um, we also talked quite a bit about ethics, and then we decided to defer this for another bright, sunny day, um, rather than go down that rabbit hole. In fact, there were a number of rabbit holes. One thing we uh, tried to get clarity around was the idea of what a valid sample might look like. Um, and similar to the conversation, uh, feedback to this to presentation, um, there was uh, this acceptance generally within our group that uh, for a sample to be a sample, there needs to be the sidecar, if you like, for associated information. And some things were not negotiable. So um, there needs to be some either research question, which was motivating the collection in the first place, or it met some kind of present or future intended purpose. Um, we talked about whether it has to be physical material or not, um, and that was another thing we deferred to another day, assuming that generally speaking, we're talking about physical samples um, here. Uh, the description we felt was non-negotiable, uh, at least a basic something about the uh, describing the sample. Uh, there was a digression into what happens when a sample loses its descriptive information, and then it more or less lapses back into being an object again. Because what is it? Well, we don't know. Um, it could be anything. And then it becomes an object for research in itself, where we might need to use other samples to identify what this object is, because we do not know. Um, personally, I found that kind of interesting, how a sample could change places and then, uh, and then it could come back again. Uh, the provenance data um, we came at from several different perspectives. Uh, personally, I believe that at a minimum we need to have a date for the collection, um, a, a point of origin, a location where it was collected, uh, information about who collected it and um, which was described here as a sample-sampler relationship. And then there's this other broader, uh, almost abstract, but I uh, would hope that in the documentation we could find some way to negotiate this, sample to the source material relationship. And there was a belief um, in our group generally that most, if not all, of the value of the sample derives from the source material. Um, that its, its reason for being lies not in itself, but in this thing that it is somehow representative of. And that further the quality of that relationship and how much we know about it, which comes back to the documentation and description, um, the quality of the relationship between the sample and what it's, its source or what it represents um, 
is like a limiting factor for its value. So if you have something that is only vaguely described and that may have been collected sometime in the early 20th century by we don't know who, or we're not quite sure what reason, um, it may have lesser numerical value by the weakness of its relationship to the source material. There are too many questions. Um, if the descriptive provenance data is stronger, then we have we can make better claims about the source. Uh, Alice and others, anything I am missing? Awesome. Rocking along. Um, Heritage sample archives want qualities matrix in my portal. Um, we discussed a number of different forms of sharing, communicating, uh, generating new knowledge, but also the historical function of um, heritage sample archives. Uh, so in and of themselves, I think this is something else that just came up in a previous presentation. Um, we can learn a lot about say, scientific practices or collecting um, heritage science practices in the early 20th century or later 20th century simply from the samples and the collected documentation itself. Um, so there's that which is kind of neat and a bit meta, um, but primarily I think we're interested in what knowledge we can generate and then selling. Uh, there was, um, Antonio um, brought this up a few times as well, and I think it's really important. Uh, also for reference um, archives, like the ones that we work with, where these archives enable the reuse of resources that are typically, if not almost always, not renewable um, and are prone to loss or theft, simply being exhausted. And then there's the didactic uh, teaching work that has been helped to build, where you do not want your undergraduates messing around with your 12th century manuscripts. And advocacy, or and this sort of moves into the next place, um, outreach, uh, increasing awareness, and more uh, cementing the value, or trying to cement the value in the minds hearts of those around, preferably those with large wallets. Um, so we, uh, the statement of significance and purpose, again, describing knowledge, uh, reaching, and uh, hopefully um, informing larger audiences, getting them engaged with your work and your research. Often this is to do with funding or internal recognition as well, where um, you are sometimes um, not naming names, uh, research wings or larger institutions tend to get ignored because they're not quite so flashy as the curatorial ones, which is where. Um, we've also discussed how for many of us, we come into this field fully aware of the value, like the, uh, the reason we are doing this rather than something else is that we already know that for us, this is important and we want to engage with it, spend our t uh, use our knowledge, expertise to work in this field. And a lot of this uh, value is implicit like we don't talk about it very often because we're talking to like-minded people who also accept, yes, of course, this is absolutely important. Um, upper management or funding bodies need these implicit values to be made explicit because they don't necessarily, they certainly do not necessarily come from the same fields. Um, but on the base of it, you're talking, for instance, with our work, maybe um, a very large number of different types of paper and it's like, tell me why your different bits of paper are important. Uh, so uh, this um, writing up the formal statement of significance uh, helps 
at network here, enable strategies to improve resource itself by being able to sell it on either uh, internally or funding external funding bodies. Uh, this, the idea was that this would also, in a sense, um, Alison was quite keen on this one, add its value to the empirical sample archive itself. Um, simply go by going through this, making the implicit explicit if you if you suddenly have a market for it. This is why it is valued here. Um, uh, and in doing this, we get strategies to actually improve the resource. So we get to start spending money to improve and save um, uh, fair data and so on. We went around and around about quite a bit with this good ways to derive the statement of significance. Um, for the group that I am, or for my part, a lot of this was to do with considering very specific audiences, um, internal and external, what their needs were, how we could articulate this value to them in a way that makes sense. Um, a little bit like role play here, putting yourself in someone else's shoes. What do I actually need to know if I were them to say, ah, oh, okay, all right, I see what you're doing. Uh, other way, um, methods discussed were simply this, uh, sitting down to articulate the value yourself, trying to work through what that means implicit, something explicit, as actually a kind of voyage of discovery. Um, and this was, I believe, uh, from a more of uh, experience, um, just simply trying to work out well, what really is valuable and this is very much a sample archive. And that along with a lot of other very interesting flybys is what we did here. Uh, fair enough. That was it. I am trying now to summarize uh, our reflection, um, of course, uh, group one and group uh, two already have uh, said the, the most of um, our, uh, our thoughts and our uh, doubts too about uh, heritage uh, some this archive. Um, <clears throat> I take some notes. Um, yesterday, firstly, we had a long uh, discussion uh, um, about the, the keywords uh, and the appropriate uh, meanings of um, a, a sample archive. Uh, well, so we finally um, uh, summarized our ideas uh, uh, with um, this, um, we tried, with this uh, definition, uh, also based on the definition present in the, in the Alcron glossary. And so uh, what is a sample archive uh, uh, for us? The heritage sample archive holds uh, one or more collections of uh, partial tangible, we reflected a lot about the word tangible and um, his value, uh, tangible elements that are examples of uh, larger objects with historical, aesthetical, artistic, and uh, documental value, uh, even more, um, also more, a lot of value that are not uh, written here. Uh, a sample archive has a systematic organization and a catalog. Um, so the second two paragraphs that you can uh, uh, read are a sort of uh, a further, um, They aim at further specifying uh, a sample archive purpose and uh, need. So, the sample archive purposes uh, uh, not necessarily defined from the beginning uh, are of uh, preservation and enduring value. And uh, this is an uh, important uh, concept in uh, our opinion uh, because of uh, their uh, potential for research. And so contributing for uh, with knowledge uh, about culture and uh, civilization 
this is the uh, what we um, mean with the heritage. Uh, so uh, they are uh, related with uh, man experience and the history of man. Um, it's holding institution uh, should account for the appropriate uh, condition of uh, preservation and uh, valorization. So uh, the human resources implied uh, in this process, uh, the storage and uh, the conservation material. So uh, we try to answer to the question, uh, the question proposed. Uh, the first question was about the qualities and values that make uh, heritage samples archives uh, so important. Uh, we arrive to the same conclusion. So the uniqueness, the rarity of these materials, of course, the cultural and historical uh, testimony, so the legacy of these materials, uh, but also we, um, we reflected about the importance of the accessibil accessibility of uh, an archive so, and uh, the complementary information that uh, an sample archive uh, could provide uh, for comparative studies. Uh, another important point uh, um, is the, are the methodological criteria and uh, the, uh, the, the documentation that could uh, accompany the evolution of ethical issues. And uh, I think this is an interesting point. Uh, uh, on which uh, we could uh, make some reflection uh, because it brings um, not only a documentation of the materials but also uh, the process, uh, the sampling process, the sampler uh, that is uh, linked to the sample itself and so on. Um, we talk about the education uh, as, a, as a value. And uh, the, uh, the last one that we uh, um, try to uh, make in evidence is the openness to progress and evolution. So uh, it could be technological or for research uh, interest and important to ensure the possibility to apply more advanced techniques uh, on the same samples in the future. So at later stage uh, with, uh, for example, non-invasive uh, techniques that are uh, now uh, available and in the past were not. And that's the reason why, uh, it's part of the reason why we have uh, this kind of uh, sample archive. Uh, the questions two were, were uh, what is the purpose of a statement of a picnic concept? For us, uh, firstly, explain the value of the archive. So promote, encourage uh, the de development uh, uh, and the use of the archive uh, to convince public and private uh, institutions, uh, stakeholders, but uh, patrons too, to support, so promote the archive to support and invest uh, in the archive necessary activities uh, uh, related to conservation and preservation of these uh, uh, But what are uh, escape elements? Uh, uh, so we have uh, this list, uh, description, description, accessibility, potential, potential potentiality, sorry for my English, <laughs> for continuity, uh, but also the archive history, uh, the relevance and the topicality, uh, so the actuality of uh, the issue itself, uh, the heritage archive. We are here for this, so I think this is uh, very important. Uh, what are good ways to derive uh, a statement of significance? Of course, uh, studying the archive and uh, identifying uh, its uniqueness, its rarity, studying uh, other statements uh, of significance uh, to understand how to improve uh, this, uh, this 
kind of uh, description and uh, promotion of uh, sample archive. Um, so uh, it is uh, necessary, of course, to be familiar with um, its content, uh, archive content, to study it in, in depth, uh, roundtables, brainstorming, discussions uh, are very important. And uh, another uh, um, thing that I'd like to underline is the, um, uh, that the sample archive uh, were formed uh, in the most part, I suppose, uh, uh, in the last century or maybe in the last few centuries, more or less. So they are very, um, it is a um, real actual topic on, on which uh, discuss. Uh, it, it, it wasn't present uh, uh, a century before us uh, as, uh, as issue. And uh, we uh, would like to um, end our presentation with uh, this um, Venn diagram, we try to uh, put together these keywords, dividing them into three groups uh, related to the three uh, important uh, words that uh, constitute the uh, definition of heritage samples archive uh, um, related to values, uh, tools, and purposes of uh, heritage samples archive. And uh, we realize that uh, uh, the central uh, um, text, uh, the, the words, uh, the keywords uh, uh, that um, fill uh, the gap uh, inside the, this diagram are the cataloging process, the database, the valorization, and the fruition of a heritage sample archive. Uh, I don't know if my, uh, my group. <laughs> Will uh, intervene? Something is missing. Okay, so thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, our group four is composed of uh, Marta Carroselli, Ana Sodevila, Eana, Ana Albar, uh, Milene Gil, myself, and Antonio Sansonetti. So, Let's go straight to our conclusions. Um, the definition of a single term and definition together. What are the key terms that would use to describe a sample archive and to communicate its purpose and significance? So um, a sample is for learning, should have a research value. In terms of representativeness, it should be representative of the total or part of the cultural object and also contain, of course, information about it. We also make differentiation between heritage samples versus mock-ups and reference samples. Um, the idea of having the archive, it must be related to a net, to a network, to links. So, meaning that a collection is the sample together with the information it contains. And together, all of this should be providing access on a long term, and also conservation is an issue. Is a issue. So, in terms of uh, cultural value, to be considered a sample, it should have a recognized value. Whatever the object or the sampling method is, a sample is relatively small, maybe big, physically, but relatively, it's small. Uh, and also regarding the number of samples, uh, one sample is not an archive. Okay, so what's a sample archive? How would, you, how would the group define it? Uh, the word heritage is we, we, we included, okay, in order to have heritage sample. It's a small part of a total that should represent or it's linked with an original artwork or a historical object. A sample is a document. It carries information. 
independently of what support is, is, it is. In terms of mockups or simulations, they simulate a conservative issue. Like for example, in order to ex study execution techniques, conservation treatments, or to understand how an object is made or how it ages. Uh, in terms of reference materials, um, are those materials used historically for creating cultural objects and also used nowadays for research purposes in order to be compared with the object or the collection under study. So um, an archive then, according to our discussions, is a collection of items together with the data and information that can be generated and also connected to them. An archive is a net of information linked to each other. An archive is a place where samples are stored physically or digitally. It should be accessible. So this notion of, of um, place is clearly related to archive, either in the cloud or physically. Um, how do we define a sample archive? A heritage sample archive then is a collection, a group of relatively small items that are linked to cultural objects and contain data of the object itself being, being stored and managed in order to be accessible on a long-term basis. And we still have some further discussion suggested points. Uh, the definition of archive being enlarged because of the, because of the fact that we are applying the traditional concept of archive with a new significance. So in this sense, a collection of documents, a collection of samples. And then we have this question. A collection, study collections should be included like we have in several museums, academies and uh, research groups as well. So, um, what qualities, value, make heritage, heritage sample archives important? Are there commonalities? So these are points we've considered. Uh, the cultural value for the archives should be listed. For every archive, we should have a connected cultural value. Physical consistency. So it should be known, understood. Right? Like for example, the number of items, the types for all of the archives. The value. And this is very interesting, you know, for example, if we were talking about the Mora collection, it may have, and it has its importance due to the worldwide distribution. So if we think about value in terms of representativeness, whatever archive has more representativeness is good, but also at the other side, the specificity of an archive, for example, if you're talking about, uh, let's say, mural paintings in the uh, Americas or connected to ancient American civilizations, then specificity is something that also should be valued. So we have value in both ends. This is what we want to mean. Uh, there's also the possibility of uh, having the archive linked with a precise point of the real objects in terms of specifically for a object and representativeness. The value is enhanced if the collection is eight in terms of mockups or simulations, they become historically important as well. We have this case in our lab I and mean, they've been produced for so many, so many years ago that now they are also important in terms of how they age. So this, uh, this is why we mentioned the value is enhanced if the collection is aged and if the environmental conditions of aging, even for the mock-ups or simulation, are known. Uh, yeah, and in terms of reference materials, uh, they can be used for different applications, depending on how the research or how the, the works or questions are posed. Uh, we've had a quite a uh, difficult question Consider uh, the, this question, the, the, the purpose, of the statement of significance. And when I saw the first group, uh, we hadn't discussed, but it was clear that, you know, we went into this discussion, but we prefer to leave it here like it was a difficult question for group four. 
Yes, thank you. So it's clear for us that the communication is based. So a state of significance is, is really related to how we communicate, how we show it to the others, how we show that it's important to our uh, collaborators or to the community in general. Uh, what are good ways to derive a statement of significance? It's to take the experience from the archive, to target the archive, and to build up a network of different archives and experiences. This is also very clear for all of us. And that's it. Finally, I'd like to, uh, to point, and, and that's why I brought my computer. Um, if I may, I, I read a recommendation out of a paper that I, I brought. You know, it's, I've been saving this paper for 35 years and I knew it was important, but please listen to me and then I tell you what it is. Uh, recommendations, the importance of reference collections of art materials which have come into being mostly from the reluctance of museum analysts to throw specimens away after they have served their initial purpose should have greater recognition. Their importance should be brought to the attention of curators and administrators who in larger museums may hardly be aware of their existence. They should be given adequate housing in, property, in properly designed storage cabinets and the specimens should be properly identified with permanent labels, permanent labels. Each laboratory, as collections increase in size, should establish, if it has not already done so, some sort of retrieval system which would, which would tie in specimens with examination records. It would be desirable if guidelines could be laid down so that this retrieval system could be made using uniform or compatible classifications. This would facilitate interlaboratory comparisons. This is a paper written by Rutherford Gettens, together with uh, Maurice Laurence Tabasso, uh, Van Asper and De Beurre, and uh, uh, Donald Buck, Buck, Robert Feller, Marisa Tabasso, Joyce Plaster, and Van Asper and De Beurre in 1969. It's very interesting. We can have the numbers, the numbers of collections, the numbers of cross sections around the world. And they mentioned within other data that, for example, uh, so far at this time, the X-ray geographies would sum up to about 40,000 items. And you know, this has been exponential. Thank you. Bon dia. So with being group five, it means I could just say, well done, everyone. You've just done a fantastic job. There's a lot of crossover. I know we're a little short on time, so I will try to be brief. Um, there were four of us, uh, Maria, Nuno, Guillermo, and myself. And as you can see, here's my colleagues hard at work. This is the process of thinking. So we started much like others with what is a sample? We're like, we can't get started until we decide what a sample is. We decided sample has intentionality. Um, it's usually taken as part of a project or an activity, as others have said, of an individual and an, or an institution. The knowledge that the sample is representative of something greater. Samples can be also materials analysed. Um, Maria was very gracious, my insistence on like reference materials. If you're going to sample them in the future, that can also be part of an archive, even if it's not collected from an actual object itself. And that a sample is often discipline specific, you know, depending on whether we're talking archaeology or um, biology or you know, bugs, um, it's, it's going to be very specific to that discipline. And that we also, uh, as with the others, um, I think our rabbit holes probably formed an entire warren. Um, so we had lots of them, but we did include a non-invasive sample um, as an assemblage of analytical data and information related to an area of a cultural heritage object. So we included the, the non-sample sample where you've just got the information from it. So we uh, we had some similar to others, a sample, a sample archive being an assemblage of physical or non-physical materials that are deliberately selected for research. They have a reason for being together uh, and that generate knowledge and all can be uh, collated to be researched in the future. So the key elements of the sample archive comprised of samples collected with a specific criterion that there's a relationship amongst those collections, not just random whatever, and that there's intention, criterion, and selection as part of that. 
that the sub archive has embedded knowledge or potential knowledge and of course usage which many people have uh, talked about as well and the epistemological value why you know that you, why you collected things in a certain time period can actually tell us a lot about the history of the discipline and what we collected and i think that's something we you know that hadn't really thought a lot about that we can go back and you know, capture that information and we we kind of came up or to fully describe um, i know it seems very simple and basic but we need to know how why what where when and who so you've got the contextual and the relevance in terms of how you create that um, the key elements there and i did a little bit differently so some of the things didn't quite fit in our descriptors some of our observations that we talked about the sample being considered a record that it's added knowledge that any a sample is any material that it's collected from objects but also what's produced from the sample that the perception is innately discipline specific and as i said before that the reference collection where there may be future reference um, and sampling and we also talked about you know the the mock-ups and the creations and the uh, the long-term aging of components but very much that there's a deliberate intent from that to make it available now or in the future um, as part of that archive the qualities or values and commonality so we see cultural heritage is inherently cross-disciplinary the cultural heritage archive allows and encourages and can um, encourages interaction between different types of knowledge that can be generated from the sample so we might have collected them as an archaeologist for a certain perspective but someone else might look at them for the paint components or so these, these those different aspects that there's scientific and research value educational document and evidential the, the dialectic relationship that i think louise also mentioned between the rare and then the similar so like the moira which has that so many countries but you might have one where it's just very specific uh, from one location um knowledge captured and potential knowledge and as many have noted also the potential to reproduce scientific or conservation um, treatments and techniques and also validate prior decisions or learn more about why that decision was made or should it be different and that's the sample archive maybe all that remains of the uh, the original cultural heritage object we're seeing that a lot more now that it could be a man-made or a um, natural disaster this may be the living representation of the object that may be all that remains uh, and again the possibility to upscale the studies the access to other collections and uh, economic as well the purpose of the statement of significance and key elements um, so it's, it's gathering a description of the archive, identification of the key values assigned to the archive. What is it? Why is it important? Um, the benefits being the internal and the external value, as we've talked about. We also talked about funders and, and, how, and how we actually communicate that and make the awareness known within our actual uh, institutions, the recognition there. Um, again, that what, how, where, when, and who. And the availability as people have noted um, good ways to derive uh, as many have said um, when, and we talked a lot about recreating the path of not only who was responsible for creating but also uh, who may have been responsible for saving it along the way that uh, interviews are really important and analyzing if we don't have that background as i know was a challenge for Moira, is there any contextual research or publications that may have come from the, the, the collection of that um, organizing meetings to discuss the intent with people who are involved and have knowledge of how it came about but there all, also might be the need to balance the, the lack of historical knowledge with the new focus of what the archive can be today so you may have this collection we may not know all of the intent of why it was collected but we can see still see the value of going forward with it today uh, the observations um just as part of our general random discussions that the sample archive sometimes represents a very rare opportunity to collect samples uh, it's part of maybe the examination of the madonna that's only been done once in 20 years so that may be a very rare um, collection um that it can actually encourage new research questions as we go back uh, and the risk of loss uh, being sort of really interesting as some people have referred to that the, the lack of an access policy 
uh, or caretaker can create a much bigger risk because you don't know who's in there. I, I noted that we often have, before we actually controlled the access, that I would open a drawer and there'd be a sticky note. Um, Eric took this in June 2012. I'm like, uh, and where is it now? It might turn up in the lab somewhere in a, a cupboard. It's like, oh, that's where it is. Um, that not being known is a huge risk. Um, and that also that the statement is significant can potentially be a living document because if we're still working on cataloging the archive, we don't know all that's in there, we may change the focus. Uh, but some of those things are really important uh, as part of that. And that was us when we finished. I think that was quite a good indication of the, how can I say, the, the the quality of the conversations that people had yesterday. It was interesting to see, you know, the commonalities that were arising, but also it was just really lovely to see the different ways in which the groups diverged and, and therefore what they brought to that, which was very rich. Um, I think what, what I'm gonna do now is I'm just going to kick us off now for day two uh, as to what we are, talking about in the class yesterday, what we're talking about today, and the groups that we're going to be going into. Day two, a little bit tougher. We're going to have three. <laughs> don't, yeah, don't frown, Tom. <laughs> um, we're going to have three uh, topics today, uh, broadly spread out across three sessions. Of course, I imagine all these conversations are going to merge and intermingle. Um, but essentially today we're going to be looking at archival processing, ethical principles, they came up a lot yesterday, so you will have time, I hope, to dive down into that rabbit hole and explore that a little bit more fully. And we're also going to be talking about access, you know, ways to improve access. So in terms of the archival processing, again, we have a number of key questions for you. You can stick rigidly and work your way through these if you want they're just there to stimulate the discussion uh, so in terms of what are key steps in our heritage samples archival management like what are the essentials what's desirable and what might be you know more advanced um, but i think we really want to get closer to like what what really is the fundamental basic steps that need to be taken uh, especially so we can work towards producing these these tools, these guides that can help others um, get a, a handle on the management of their collections and archives. Um, so really in terms of what are good ways to help institutions do that. Um, and really also because these things are like opening a series of boxes, aren't they? You know, so what then additional guidance documents might be needed? on top of a step-by-step -step guide for archival management because each thing takes you to another level. So essentially the task for that is to outline those steps and you could do it in a diagram uh, or a document or I don't know, interpretive dance, whatever way you want, okay? So to find a way of um, visualizing that. Uh, the, other, the next session on ethical principles, uh, essentially what fundamental ethical principles should underpin the collection, use and management. So the whole life cycle we're talking here of, of a sample. And essentially there the task is to um, work towards a statement on ethical principles. And then finally with regards to access. What are the primary challenges for access provision and in what ways could institutions address these challenges in order to enhance access? And that really is also looking within the existing resources. So it's very easy to dream up strategies, I think. Um, you know, if you had all the time, and money and personnel in the world, but that's not the case. So it's really just working with what we have. How can we make things better? And again, the task there is to come up with some suggested strategies. Now, these are the day two discussion groups. So we've mixed you all up again. Um, so please just take a note of which group you're in. Um, and uh, we will meet again in the, in the rooms where we were yesterday. 
Uh, I just wanted also to say that uh, looking in the program for today, um, we're going to do the recap at the end of the day. So at 4.30, there is a coffee break just before that. So, but it means that um, it's a little bit tougher. So we're hoping that um, this won't be insurmountable, that by, by 4.30, we'll end up with five PowerPoint slides and people to present those those uh, messages from the various groups back. Okay, so that's the, the kind of finishing line. And uh, with that, you'll be rewarded later on with a nice glass of wine. <laughs> so it's something something worth walking, working towards. And Elaine will also tell us more about that in due course. Thanks. <laughs>